Hello, and welcome to Did You Know Gaming Extra. In this bonus episode, we'll be looking at some interesting instances of theft in gaming history. Before we get into the trivia, however, we'd like to talk to you about the online safety software LastPass, which is sponsoring this thematically appropriate video. LastPass is a piece of password management software that lets you manage all your passwords and protect them as encrypted data behind one master password. This means there's no hassle if you forget one of your passwords, and no need to worry about someone stealing your data or identity and locking you out of your accounts. LastPass is an extension that works with a large range of web browsers, including Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, and Apple Safari. LastPass is even on mobile, and will autofill your credentials when sites and apps open on iOS, Android, and even Windows Phone devices. Your settings are synchronized to any device the LastPass software is on, and LastPass supports other security features such as password generation and two-factor authentication. We at Digino Gaming use LastPass ourselves and are genuinely happy to let people know about this product. If you have trouble remembering dozens of passwords or just want to better protect your identity, the link is in the description down below. Thanks again to LastPass for sponsoring this video. And with that said, on to the trivia. Whether we're talking about IP, software, or physical products, Nintendo are fairly protective of their creations. Unfortunately for them, there are some situations where you just have to accept loss. One such event happened to Nintendo in May 2015, where an entire truck full of special edition Splatoon games was stolen during a heist. The vehicle was commandeered at some point while it was hauling its cargo from Nintendo's European headquarters. The truck was carrying gaming retailer Games' entire shipment of Splatoon's Special Edition release for Wii U, which left them with no option but to offer a substitute to customers. People who had pre-ordered the game could choose between the standard edition of the game with a discount, or to cancel their pre-order altogether. A Nintendo UK spokesperson told Eurogamer, we can confirm that the lorry transporting the Splatoon stock from Nintendo's European warehouse to Game UK has been stolen. Whilst these unfortunate circumstances were out of Nintendo UK and Game's control, we apologize for any inconvenience or disappointment that this has caused. In September 2007, in the city of Leeuwarden in the Netherlands, a 13-year-old boy was threatened with violence by two other boys aged 14 and 15 in demand of his amulet and mask from the free-to-play MMORPG RuneScape. The two were subsequently convicted in 2009, but in 2012, one of the thieves took to the Dutch Supreme Court with an appeal on the grounds that they hadn't stolen anything, as the virtual items did not exist. The court upheld the conviction and gave him 144 hours of community service on the grounds that the items must have some value, as the boy had invested time and energy in obtaining them while playing the game. Threats and violence aren't the only way of convincing others to give access to their equipment, however. In 2009, a man in Somerset was given a police caution when he obtained a large number of account details for users of RuneScape, which he had obtained through a phishing scam, getting the details from unsuspecting players through a fake website. A policy agreement with RuneScape, as with many online games, requires the player to not trade items in the game for real-world gain. However, on July 22, 2012, 19-year-old Humza Bajivar organized a deal with Jonathan Dockler, a student from Fordham University, to receive 5 billion coins in RuneScape in exchange for $3,300. Bajivar was unwilling to do bank transfers, and said he'd only make the exchange with cash and in person. Dockler sent his friend, David Imani, to the exchange while he waited by his computer, ready to transfer the goods. At the meeting, Bajava transferred the money he was carrying from one envelope to another, a move that David spotted to be out of the ordinary. David backed out of the deal quickly, calling Jonathan to ensure that he hadn't gone through with the deal. Jonathan then convinced David to try again the next day. This time, David was prepared, bringing a $100 bill to compare with fake notes. David saw that Bajava's money was indeed illegitimate, and Bajava responded with a BB gun, threatening them into making the transfer. David told the New York Post, I couldn't believe I was about to get shot over RuneScape. I was so scared I was about to die. He called Jonathan and told him to make the transfer. Humza Bajava was later caught after checking surveillance footage. But RuneScape isn't the only game that suffers from scandalous skullduggery. 
in February 2005, Legend of Mir 3 player Chiyu Cheng Wei allowed another player, Chu Xiao Yuan, to borrow a Dragon Saber. Xiao Yuan promptly sold the Saber for 7,200 Yuan, which at the time roughly equated to $870. When Shang Wei didn't receive his sword back, he reported the incident with the police. But at the time, there were no laws relating to the theft of virtual property, so nothing could be done. Chu Sao Yuan said that he would give the money to Cheng Wei, but with less than a month having gone by, Cheng Wei grew impatient. He subsequently stabbed Chu Sao Yuan in the chest, resulting in death. Cheng Wei gave himself into the police and confessed to intentional injury. He was sentenced to life in prison, though his time was reduced due to good behavior. Sometimes a company can fight back against thieves online, as was the case with Blizzard and Diablo 3. For a time, Blizzard included an online auction house within Diablo 3 to provide a convenient and secure method of trading items for in-game gold. The auction house was split into two. One half allowed players to buy and sell with in-game currency, and the other allowed for buying and selling with real-world money. Blizzard games had, for a while, been used for real-world profit. Gold farming in World of Warcraft was considered a real job in many places, with, at one point, over 100,000 people being full-time gold farmers in China, obtaining gold in the game to sell for real money outside of Blizzard's control. With Blizzard's introduction of a real money auction house within Diablo 3, they hoped it would make buying and selling items more secure, and also make Blizzard a little commission on each sale. However, it also introduced a solid, tangible, real-world value to their virtual items. In 2012, the same year of the game's release, two players decided to use illicit means to steal items from others. According to court documents, Californian Patrick Nepomuceno and Michael Stinger of Maryland stole and sold over $8,000 worth of items from players through the use of a remote access tool, or RAT, disguised as a link to an image of a rare item. The duo would send the link to other players, and have their character drop all of their valuables only for their own Demon Hunter character to swing by and collect everything that had been dropped. After 20 to 30 players afflicted by the thefts reported the cases to Blizzard, they had their items replaced by the company, and the theft was taken to prosecutors. At the time, Michael Stinger was 21 and claimed that the two-man operation had gone on for a few months, but that he had no idea he was sharing malware, or that Patrick Nepomuceno was remotely accessing the victim's computers. Splinter News contacted Stinger, who said, He just told me to share the link and I would get free items. I thought Patrick was doing some glitch. I didn't really care, lol. I was getting free stuff. I was not driven for the money. I simply wanted to get better gear for my character, good weapons and armor. Later in December 2012, FBI agents raided his home, seized his computer, and accused him of committing a felony. Federal prosecutor Tracy Wilkerson, who worked on the case, claimed that because Blizzard replaced the items, they had to find some other means of calculating the value Blizzard had lost in the ordeal. Wilkerson said, Blizzard gave the victims the goods back. That made the loss calculation difficult, as the victims were reimbursed. So instead, we calculated the perpetrator's gain. Prosecutors claimed that the goods were sold for over $8,000, making the crime a felony, a claim that Stinger disputes. He said, We made zero dollars. We had plenty of high-value items that we were going to sell, yes. Perhaps the items were valued at nine grand, but nothing was sold and no currency exchanged hands. I got banned before I could sell anything. The bigger issue was not the financial element, but the means in which the items were obtained, unauthorized impairment of a protected computer. This is a misdemeanor which the pair both pled guilty to in 2014. They were given two and three months probation and were forced to pay Blizzard $5,654.61 to reflect the cost of the company's investigation. Wilkerson blames the issue on an extension of online crime in general, saying, People think they are not going to get caught, that they're not going to be found in their bedrooms on a computer. They don't think it's that big of a deal. Gaming especially lends itself to this suspension of reality. The auction house was closed in 2014, as Blizzard deemed the system to undermine the game's loot-based mechanics. And now it's time for this episode's random piece of trivia. Today we're looking at Condemned Criminal Origins, which released for PC and Xbox 360. In the Xbox 360 release, a total of 970 points could be earned for a player's gamer score through achievements, while most games have a total of 1,000 points. 
It's rumoured that the game was set to receive DLC, which would add the additional 30 points to the game's total. But these never came to fruition. This isn't the only game to have under 1000 gamer score, however, as during the early life cycle of the 360, Microsoft had not yet laid out guidelines on how the system should be used. It was eventually decided that these rules would have retail games reward a player of 1000 gamer score with a total of 50 achievements, allowing for expansion through DLC to up the figure to a maximum of 1750 points and 80 achievements, though only allowing an additional 250 points and 10 achievements per quarter. Be sure to subscribe to Digino Gaming if you haven't already, and hit the bell to keep being notified about our new videos. Shoot us a like too if you're feeling generous. Otherwise, hopefully we'll catch you next time, and don't forget to stay extra crunchy.